Good morning, everyone, or I should say almost everyone. As in Bible school, we can see that as the week goes on, sometimes the attendance uh, dribbles in a little bit more slowly. Each morning, we've been waiting for a certain number to sign on to the online classroom before we start, just to make sure we're not missing anybody. Good to have you with us again this morning. Good to see you here, Luke. Hope you're okay. Noticed you weren't in class yesterday. Hope you're not ill. Hope everything's all good on your end. Anyway, I thought I'd try something a little bit different here today. Um, and we might even try something way different tomorrow, but we'll see. Anyways, today I thought, and now you'll be glad if you follow the instructions for our emergency health care and safety plan on campus. Because if you did, you will by now have my cell number in your phone or on your device, which means you can text me. So, can't promise to answer all the texts during class today. Can't promise that I'll get to them all in the order that they come. But if and as you have questions that seem to fit uh, what we're talking about that might be a benefit to yourself and the others listening today, shoot me a text with your question. Try to keep it concise and don't be a question hog. And then we'll uh, do some interactivity that way instead. Sound good? Well, the good thing about me not being able to hear you is that uh, I'm just going to go with sounds good. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, we are blessed. In some ways, Lord, I think we are coming to recognize our need for you more than ever. And we thank you for that. But in ways related to that, Lord, we are coming to discover your faithfulness and your kindness towards us, towards others, perhaps in ways that we've not really known before. I pray that would be the case, Lord. We do thank you for your presence in our midst, that by your Spirit you live in us, not around us only or near us, but in us, that we are alive because of you, that we are new creations because of you, that we can know you. And Lord, we thank you that you know us too and that you see us, and that you hear us. Speak to us, Lord. Today, we need you. We know from your own testimony, Lord, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lord, I pray that today, as you speak to us through your word and by your spirit, Again, this good seed would find good soil, take root, bear fruit, and be multiplied, Lord. Lord, save us today. Save us from all the distractions and the doubts and the speculations and the interruptions that would slowly bend our thoughts and minds away from the truth that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from these things, that we might walk in the fullness of your joy and peace because of the truth that we have in you. Lord, we could spend all day praying and just giving thanks for the abundance of your faithfulness and your love demonstrated to us and through us. Lord Jesus, we look forward to today and all that you yet have in store. Thanks for the chance to start the day this way, together, towards that end. In your name we pray, amen. We are in 2 Timothy and chapter 2, and we were leading up to verses 10 and 11 prior to our wrap-up yesterday. So just a quick review of verse 9, or I should say, yeah, 8 and 9. Um, Remember Jesus Christ. From the beginning, this has been a, a theme, but of course much more than a theme, a foundational truth, uh, an essential instruction that we must remember Jesus. For this is the basis. He is the basis of all truth. He is truth, but he is also the basis of all truth demonstrated by his very character and his spirit and his word and all of creation. We must remember 
Jesus. Not just remember briefly, but we, mean, we must reflect on, meditate on, linger in, consider, dwell on. We must remember Jesus. Jesus who came to save us. Jesus who died to be able to forgive us, but Jesus who rose to life that he might give us life and live in us also. So let us start today remembering Jesus. 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. Paul reflects on his hardship as nothing to be compared to the value of knowing him the blessing and, and the fullness and the power of the work of God in our lives, measuring so more greatly than any suffering we could encounter, even, even the suffering facilitating in many ways our ability or our motivation to draw near to him and to know him in ways that we may not have been able to before or at least not like this. On the basis of God's faithfulness, Paul says he's willing to endure wrong accusation, false imprisonment. In fact, anything, all things, if it means that we, that they also might obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. We see the heart of God through the heart of Paul communicated to Timothy and to us. That the desire and the appreciation goes so much farther beyond our receiving from the Lord life and everything we need for life and godliness, but that it would translate into our desire being his heart for others through us also that they might come into the same type of relationship, living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. In chapter 2, verse 11, it says this. It is a trustworthy statement, and that is not to say the rest of the statements were not trustworthy or anything less than trustworthy, only it is a matter of restating or underlining or emphasizing this statement. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. We worry about a lot of things, folks. We worry about so many things. In fact, you know, some of the, I guess, the greatest things we worry about uh, so, or by the books, what the numbers say is people really worry about change. Change is tough. Uh, losing control, that would be something we all deal with in different ways, but is very difficult for us as humans. Even, even just a change to our creature comforts, the things we have become used to or expect, any kind of change like that is very difficult for us. But if you boil it down, I think many, if not most, to some degree or other, we fear death. We fear the possibility of no longer living or ceasing to exist and things of that nature. We, we just have, there's unknowns, there's question marks, there's and certainly we don't want to engage or endure suffering on the way to death. Yet, if we believe what we believe about who God is and what he's done and who we are because of who he is, then we yet have nothing to fear, in fact. So we might as well address this head on because certainly, spiritually, we are called to die that we might live. We're not called to die so that we might suffer, so that we might be dead. We are called to die so that we might be made alive in him. Daily, this is our spiritual priority because we are a new creation in him. So we like to say we're called from death to life, and we are, and we, we call, we're called to many things, but we are called to die. That is the 
reality and something we need to embrace and get our heads around in a different sort of a way, not a negative way. This will be our salvation. It says this, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Now death to the body will come to all. And those who perish in their fleshly sense in the Lord will also live again with him. But when we die to the flesh, as it were, now, right now, or in five minutes from now, when we die to the flesh, that is when we truly live, when we die to the flesh. And in the next verse there, it says, if we endure with him, there's that word again, endurance, to persevere, to press on, to stay the course, to keep walking. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. That is not to say that he will disappear from us if we don't endure, or that he will cease to be faithful, or his love for us will change. The fact of the matter is, is that if we endure with him, if we stay in step with him, if, if we remain in him as he is in us, then we will also be participant to all of the fullness of the power of God as he unfolds his work in and through and around our lives. We will be part of the best of the best of the best in him, with him, through him, for his glory, for our sake, and for the benefit of everyone else. This is how he intended it. Endurance, though, folks, will be required. Uh, this is something that's come up previously in the letter. It's come up again, and it will come up yet again. And I believe with my whole heart that endurance is something we're about to learn a lot about in our day-to-day -day lives if we haven't begun that journey already. But along with that, considering the scriptures we previously looked at, we looked at the result of Endurance, being a character that is tested and proven in the Lord. And that as a result of a character that is proven, the faithfulness of God proven through our humanity, that hope is the result. And that hope does not disappoint. Just a word of encouragement to you today that as much as we should anticipate suffering or maybe suffering currently, that we can anticipate, we can plan on the kindness, the grace, the mercy, the faithfulness, the love, the provision and the protection of the Lord in it. And that we can know hope and all the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, including love and joy and peace and patience and all the rest of it. These things, the best things, can be not only a part of our suffering, but the main event. Suffering, yes. Reality, but not the main event. See how we have to shift that perspective? This isn't wishful thinking or, or some kind of new psychology. This is the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel that we have received. Verse 13 says this. Ah, sorry, I think I need to go back to verse 12. Yes, I, I had skipped that part in my notes unintentionally, and I got in trouble for that last time. If we endure with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Well, of course that means that as long as we're doing pretty good to get it right most of the day and not steering too far off the path or falling down too many times, of course that means that we're okay. But if we uh, maybe stumble a few too many times or veer off the path a little bit too much, of course, um, if we deny him, then he would deny us, which means that he would leave us. It means that we would not be secure in our salvation. It means that our, our relationship with God would probably be suspect, if not entirely desecrated. 
I'm being dramatic, and I am trying to make a point. If we stop that, if we stop there at, if we deny him, he will deny us. What we've just done there is take something completely out of context and upend the entire gospel. And if we're going to upend the entire gospel, then we've got nothing left to say. We need to apologize for everything we've already said, and we need to walk away and do something different. You, me, and all of the rest of everyone who's ever put, ever put their faith in a faithful God. But truly, it is not the denial removing himself from us or separating us from the love of God or that we should be damned to eternal hellfire. Certainly not. And the next verse, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. And it, he is in us. We know elsewhere from scripture, I shouldn't need to recap it here, but he will never leave you or forsake you. You've been bought with a price, adopted, sealed by the Holy Spirit. What then can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. We know these things, but then so easily we can let a verse like this call into question our confidence in Christ. Listen, here's the deal. We already talked about it. We'll talk about it again. We'll look more closely at it right now for a minute, but I want you to dig into this. The character of God. He cannot change. He cannot deny himself. So what then does it mean that if we deny him, he will deny us also? For right thereafter, it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Folks, I would like to suggest that there are definitely are consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death, and sin by itself bears all sorts of varieties of fruit that is diametrically opposed and very, very different than that which is the fruit of the Spirit. And one leads to death, and one leads to life. If we are going to, having received the truth of God in our lives, by his word, through his spirit, and then we are to deny him on whatever level that may be, uh, maybe it's just kind of a little bit of a compromise here or there, or maybe it's outright saying, I do not believe. The point is this, when we walk closely in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, in faith and by obedience, we are in a situation whereby he is able to allow and to pour all of his power through us in whatever way he wants so that he might do through us whatever he wants, however he wants. When we deny him in small ways or large ways, we prevent him, we say no to him, we start stopping him from doing the things that he will only do in and through us by our permission, by our agreement, by our fellowship. And so when we begin to deny him, we, we literally begin to deny him the permission, the opportunity to express the fullness of his character through us. And so therefore, we will also be denied the expression of his fullness through us in some ways. But he does not leave us. He will not forsake us. He will still be in you and for you. He will still demonstrate his faithfulness and mercy and grace and love but it's like we put, and don't take this wrong, please, I know this could be misconstrued, and I don't mean it the wrong way, but it's like we handicap God. And of course, God is all-powerful. He can't be handicapped, but he will not do in you what, he will not, what you will not let him do in you. This is where the death comes in, where we must die to ourselves, where we must allow God to be God, and we do that by hearing the word, and not just by hearing the word, but by being doers of the word. And in so 
Therefore, we get to enjoy the benefit and, and the demonstration of the word being made manifest through our lives. When we deny God, we impede that process. I hope that brings some clarity to the, uh, the question and is helpful. I do hope we have some people listening uh, for I have not received any texts yet. So that either means that you have no questions or you're not in attendance or you have not got my number. Either way, I will check to see if I get a text here from anyone as we go through this. Just a little sip of uh, coffee, please. It's cold, as are most of my coffees, by the time I get to them, but it's still good. <sighs> God is faithful. Even when we are faithful, uh, sorry, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. Check that out. That is amazing. That is amazing. He, we will fall down. We will miss the mark. We will step to the left or the right to this sometimes. But he is steady, constant, and faithful. Wonderful. Verse 14, it says this. Remind them of these things. What things? Everything we've just been talking about. The character of God, the faithfulness of God. The results of allowing God to be God and the cost to preventing God from being God in your life. Remind them of these things, folks. This is a charge not just to Timothy. This is a charge to me, and this is a charge to you. Remind them. Remind who? Whoever the Lord puts in your path. Whoever the Lord brings across your day by whatever means he provides. Remind them of the faithfulness of God. Speak it. Live it. Write it. Lots of people right now especially will be worried about this, worried about that. And you know, worry also leads to complaining. Nobody's doing enough. Nobody's doing enough fast enough. I don't have enough information. I don't understand. When will this be over? It's not fair. The time is right now, in the middle of all that, whatever that is, to speak to act the truth, to remind them, not as if you're better or I'm better, but as we are being reminded now to remind them about the faithfulness of God. Praise the Lord. Absolutely wonderful. Actually am getting some text here. That's good. I'm going to start streaming through this. I think Brother Luke is trying to make up for his absence in class yesterday by being the first one to text me today. You're, you're back. You earned your points. You're back on a level scale. Okay, Luke? We're good now, see? Because unlike, you know, not earning salvation, you do have to earn certain things in relationship to your standing in class. I'm just kidding. So Luke had some thoughts about the denial of Christ. As certain places in Scripture, certainly there is like the denial of Christ, the never having received Christ, the, and then there's the blaspheming of Christ um, as well. And there are many ways to deny Christ, of course. Um, some will deny him and never receive him. Some will receive him and then go on to, in a sense, deny him in whatever way it might be. What we need to focus on here, not to dismiss the rest, and of course we could have long conversations about this, is the faithfulness of God. If there is any doubt to the faithfulness or certainty of God, then we are all on thin ice and a slippery uphill slope. Because if God's faithfulness is called into question, we got nothing. And there is nothing different about our salvation because of God's because of our Heavenly Father, Christ Jesus, there's nothing different about then the religion we subscribe to than any other religion which demands that we be good enough to tip the scale in our favor. And folks, 
I hope you know as well as I do that I, will speak for myself, will never be good enough to tip the scale in my favor. I am fully counting on and depending on the faithfulness and unwaveringness of the faithfulness of God. That's it. Now, uh, the question was, what about the verse in Matthew 10, 30, where the Lord said, whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. It seems like 2 Timothy 12 is related to this one in Matthew. I can see that as well. There are crossovers in that. Um, I don't believe the application is identical in these two verses. I do believe, in fact, that there is a difference between someone Oh, like I said previously, it is possible to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a Christian, um, sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is, uh, this is our, our situation with God. But we can still, in, in that relationship with God, continue and deny Him in different ways. That doesn't undo our salvation. It certainly in, impacts our situation. There are those, of course, though, that will never receive by faith, God, the Holy Spirit. And if anyone were to not put their faith in Jesus and deny him in that way, then yes, certainly, they also will be denied eternal life. For one cannot have eternal life now or later apart from faith in Jesus Christ. And if that faith is never put in Jesus Christ, then there is no eternal life to be had. Um, I'm trying to keep things concise so that we can move through. But as with any of your questions, if you do not feel that they're answered satisfactorily, we can continue to dialogue after class and in other formats. Most of you know how to get a hold of me. Also this, I hope that these questions and this dialogue will serve as an opportunity for you to take responsibility to dig in scripture and in prayer with the Lord, so that you might have the wisdom and the insight and the conviction and the affirmation that can only come from the Lord by His Spirit. And I hope that doesn't sound like an easy way out. Um, anything I'm going to answer to you, I'm only going to point you back to what the Scripture says and what I understand it to mean as I have done the same thing I'm asking of you. hope that makes sense. Probably a few too many words on that. Um, I, didn't, I haven't had my computer up here with me the last few days um, because I felt it would be a distraction, but I really miss the interaction with you. And uh, I had a similar question uh, from someone else. I don't have your number in my phone. I apologize. It's an 819 number. Is it denial of Christ as Savior? Like someone quit believing in God for his salvation? And again, I'll just point you back to what I previously said. Yes, a denial of Christ as Savior if that was the case and remained the case. But remember that what man does cannot undo what God does. When God comes in, he stays there. When God gives life, when he, when he becomes your life, he doesn't unbecome your life. This is all speaking to the faithfulness of God. If God is not faithful, then he is not God, and I don't want any part of a God that isn't faithful, and neither should you. Because it, then there is no truth then there is no salvation. And truly then, if that's the case, there is no hope. And of course, we know that without hope, it is a very, very uh, dire and bleak picture. Oh, thank you, that was from Joel. Joel, good to get your email yesterday. I really appreciated hearing from you. I know we ask you guys, hey, throw us an email. Tell us how you can, we can pray for you or tell us how you're doing. And to be quite honest, I think maybe everybody expects that everybody's doing it so they don't want to bother me or bother us. But to be quite true, not very many people are doing it. Um, I'm so stoked because later today, we're going to be uh, meeting with our home group, as I'm sure some of you are, to go through uh, the next seminar chapters in John, and I'm, it's been way too long. I'm so glad we're coming around to being able to spend some time in the Word with our home group. Although it not be in our home, it will be still very good. Jacob, I can hardly wait to talk to you, man. We're going to have to talk after. Also, it's been way too long. Um, glad to see you here in this format as well. So in, in verse 15, it says this.
Oh, sorry, verse 14, I should say, it says this. It kind of comes out of that last portion seemingly a little bit randomly, but it's not really random. It's all tied together because now we're starting to get in to certain kind of nitty gritty applications that in undoubtedly came out of real life situations that they, they were facing or aware of in the uh, bodies they were serving. So here's, these are now, we're, we're, we're bringing it down a level to specific instructions. We've been looking at things in a sense from a higher level in principle and theologically and doctrinally in order to have that foundation or platform or jumping point off of which everything comes from or goes back to. So in verse 15, no, 14, I'll get this right. It says this, remind them of the things, remind them and solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Folks, this is so important. It's always been important, but especially now with social media and media and, you know, we're, we really live in, a, what is it called, a global community. We live in a global community, whereas if I say something right now, it can travel around the world at light speed and come back to me entirely differently in five minutes. We live in a crazy world where information, whether it be accurate or false or some kind of muddled combination, transmits, transmits, transmits. I don't even want to tell you some of the things I've heard about this recent health, health thing, about ways that people are proposing that we deal with it or things that can cure it. It's just insane. That's just one example. However, we are reminded here by Paul to Timothy many, 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 many years ago that the same problem of humanity exists. It is so easy to be distracted by whatever the present context is we are in the middle of and facing. And when we are distracted by things, and that's why we had the example of the, the soldier and the athlete being laser focused on their call, on their tasking. Because when we're distracted, our minds wander, our thoughts wander, that impacts our hearts. We start talking about things that really aren't important. Those things turn into arguments, those things, and there's speculation, there's all sorts of conjecture. Then we start to breed ill will about people who don't share the same speculation as we share. It just leads to the ruin of both the speaker and the hearer. So Paul is saying this, I'm kind of um, going to reconstruct in my own way what I hear here. We've talked about a lot of important stuff, folks. Talked about the character of God, his love, his power, his work in our lives, the way he's saving us, the way he's protecting us, and the things he has planned for us because he loves us. So stop talking about other stuff that doesn't benefit you. Stop arguing about things that just cause problems. Stop guessing. Focus on what you do know. Walk accordingly to that. Put your hope in Christ. Lift each other up. Don't drag each other down. This is the heart of Paul's words through these instructions, but he even takes it pretty farther. He says, all that stuff, when we start wrangling about words and, and, and speculating and conjecting and all the rest of it, it actually can lead to the ruin of the hearer. Certainly, none of us need help being ruined, thank you. We need help being saved, lifted up, encouraged, edified. This is our job, certainly within the body of Christ, but also to everyone else who Christ died for and came to save. Something that somebody told me that the way they kind of walk through challenges of communication with their kids is something I've been trying to impart in, in, in my family as well. Sometimes do better at it the other. But what, I, what I'm trying to challenge myself with, as well as my kids, is think about the result of what you say. Is what you say going to bring about anything good? If not... Don't say it. I know there's a simpler way to say that, like if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. But I think if we think about it, what's going to happen as a result of what you say? Is there any good that can come of it? Well, if not, then maybe just zip it 
and wait till something more intelligent comes across your brain. That's a word for me too, trust me. To be quick to listen and to be slow to speak. Whew. I mean, when it's my job to speak, I think it's okay if I adjust the tempo. I think the message is that we should be working twice as hard to listen and working twice as hard to speak half as much in most situations. Listening will be beneficial far more than speaking. Of course, that is not to neglect the fact that speaking is also necessary. 2 verse 15 says this, be diligent to present yourself Prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. This whole idea of having a pure heart and a clean conscience. And, and this is what he means by that. Also, accurately handling the word of God of truth. The word of truth. Interesting. How do we accurately handle the word of truth? Well, we can do that in a couple different ways. Actually, in many different ways. What I say about God certainly would be a part of that, accurately handling the word of God. Not something to be taken lightly at all. But accurately handling the word of God also refers to the way we walk and live our lives by faith and obedience and the way that God works out his character through our lives. The way we live is also part of accurately handling the word of God. And so we are to be diligent it is to be important. We are to be intentional about it. That we would present ourselves to him with a clean conscience so that we might be right with him and approved by him in order to be used by him to the fullest extent of his power through us. And if we walk this way with our Lord and Savior, our Master, our Father, we have no reason to be ashamed. He's not asking for perfection, although perfection is the standard. He's asking that we would present ourselves approved with, with a right heart, not needing to be ashamed. The word of truth is used a few times as it refers in every case to the to the gospel. We must purpose and be intentional with our words and our actions. Is the goal that these things would accurately reflect the character and the work and the love and the power of God. And so this seems to have been a bit of a problem then, as I'm sure it is now in many ways, because he continues to go on about the talking. And he says this, to clarify, avoid worldly and empty chatter. Just stop wasting conversation about things that matter not and bear no fruit. For talking about things like that just lead to further ungodliness. For those of you who were in my previously, previous classes, you'll remember my wonderful and amazing analogy about near and far. Well, I can't do that today because I'd knock over the speakers and run right into Sony's sound desk. But things are either leading us towards him or away from him. And when we waste our time, we waste our time talking about things of no consequence. Not only does it lead to the ruin of the hearer, it actually leads to further ungodliness all the way around. So why would we undo the work of the Lord like that? And it says even more so, not even after leading to ungodliness, that kind of talk, that kind of wasting our time like that actually spreads like gangrene. And I don't know if you are not know, you can Google it and get a really good, just go gangrene pictures. I promise you, you'll never forget this lesson. And you can always remind me that I was the guy that talked about gangrene, if that helps you. But gangrene is not pretty. Gangrene is a gaseous, infection that takes in place in the body where there is a lack of oxygen, a crazy infection, and it's almost unstoppable. It permeates the flesh, 
and it spreads like wildfire. That's why they're saying spreads like gangrene. It takes hold of the thing it takes hold of and it gets in deep and it spreads like fire. And this is, this is the picture that Paul is using here to describe the result of ungodliness and wasting our time speculating in conjecture, guessing, or trying to convince others about stuff that is not only not matter, it's of no benefit. In fact, it's harmful, and in fact, it spreads. So if we want to spread death like wildfire, then we should just keep on complaining. Complain about this, complain about that. We should keep on guessing. When, when will this happen? When will this happen? Well, if this doesn't happen, we should, comp- we should keep complaining about what's not fair. And we, If we want to walk towards death and spread that kind of downfall like cancer, then we should just keep talking about stuff like that. But we should not, and we do not need to. In fact, we must not. We must talk and walk in line with what we remember intentionally about who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, and who we are because of him. In that way, death will be overthrown. Disease will be thwarted. And I don't mean that there will be no sickness in this life, but I I hope you understand what I'm referring to. I'm referring to victory, salvation, and freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. This is instruction for good measure to be sure. It is worth our while to heed these warnings. And in verse 18, and we probably won't go much longer today. Some of you are thankful for that. Verse 18 says this, verse 17, and well, 17 leading into 18. He was just talking about how this talk spreads like gangrene. And he names people. Uh Uh-oh. But he names them. You can see their names there. Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and that they, and they, thus they upset the faith of some. Some. They're talking about stuff they don't know about. And they're trying to convince others of the same thing. Don't talk about what you don't know. We have enough to talk about with what we do know by the wisdom and grace of God. We have enough to walk in according to what we do know by the wisdom of the grace. We don't need to speculate about anything. We got to, our hands and our plates should be full with that which we know by the instruction of God to our hearts from his word and by his spirit. If you've got time to start being, writing choose your own adventure stories for someone else, you've got way too much time on your hands, folks. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. In other words, there is no opposition. There is no desecration. There is no attack or, or, or anything that can take away from or, or destroy or damage even the foundation that is the gospel, the truth about God. Nevertheless, the firm foundation stands. Having this seal, and this is also good news, folks, the, and this is a quote, the Lord knows who are his. Listen, listen, he doesn't just have a list with your name on it, although he does. It's not just that the Lord has a list with your name on it. The Lord knows you. That to be certain That to be certain. And he knows you are his. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. The two things just don't go together, folks. Light and dark, death and life, the fruit of the Spirit, and we'll talk about this and see this more clearly, but of course, folks, there is fruit. There is the fruit of sin, the fruit of unrighteousness, And the fruit of unrighteousness is a very different fruit than the fruit of the Spirit. And it is not natural that they should coexist, for they have their origin in different seeds, and so so therefore they bear different fruit. One, the fruit that testifies to the life 
and the character and the love and the faithfulness and the hope we have in Christ Jesus. The other kind of fruits or fruit leads decidedly to destruction and death and damnation and futility and hopelessness. And so the instruction here is that even though the foundation is strong and, and we are sealed and the Lord knows we are his, that everyone, it's just a reminder, it's, just, it's, like, it's almost like a rhetorical statement, but that if we are his, even as he is ours, it should be obvious to us then that we should abstain from wickedness. Things that would be contradictory to the truth about God. Things that would not be telling the truth about his person or his work or his will or his power or his love or his faithfulness. We need to literally, we'll talk about this too, not just like, like not be okay with that stuff. We need to be able to call it out and run away from those things for our sake, certainly, for God's glory and for the benefit of others. I've said this before, but in a world such as ours where we face every manner of temptation because everything is available at the push of a button or a swipe of a card, the temptations we run into or the, the threats we run into that challenge us in the spiritual way are not that there would be demons and angels fighting visibly in front of us or boogeymen under our bed. The, the greatest temptation and the greatest threat to our walk with the Lord, in fact, are subtle temptations, sparkly temptations. Just a little bit of this, just a little bit of that. Maybe it's not the truth, but it's not a lie. Maybe it's not that bad, or it's not as bad as what they're doing. The greatest trick, folks, the devil will have ever played is to convince the world at large that there is no devil, because if there is no devil, we have no problems. But there is an enemy of our soul, and we do have this battle before us because of that. And that enemy, combined with our flesh nature, pairs up to give us cause for concern in this regard. We need to be aware, mindful, awake, in order that we may walk in the power and the wisdom and the salvation that the Lord has provided for us. So we need to abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only, this is verse 20, not only gold and silver vessels, but there are also vessels of wood and earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, are wooden and earthenware vessels useless? No, they have their purpose. They have their pur purpose for certain things. They do their job very well for certain things. And they're set apart to do certain jobs. But check this out. Therefore, verse 21, if a man cleanses himself from these things, unrighteousness, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, prepared, set apart, and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Here's the message, folks. It's not to judge, say, that person's a wood vessel, I'm a silver vessel, or, or to criticize yourself. I'm not sure if I'm good enough. That's, that's not the issue here. The issue here is that we have been called by him and set apart by him for him to do good works for him that he's prepared for us ahead of time. So we want to me make sure that we in fact are being those people who walk in such a way with clear consciences and a clean heart uh, in submission to the Lord with no barriers so that we might be fully available to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we may be used in every good way at his discretion for the things he wants to do. Because he has set us apart to do these things. And we have a part to play in remaining prepared and available so that he might use us for those purposes.
thank you, Kevin. Um, he jumped in on the text queue here, just in perfect Kevin format. It has nothing to do with my class, and only that he has some checks that he needs me to sign as soon as possible. Good one. And I knew that he would do this, so you know these are the dangers of opening things up online. I wouldn't be surprised if he walked in here now and sat down in the front row, because I know he's listening. But anyways, keeps life interesting. Just a couple thoughts before we close on this. The instruction that we might be protected. The command with a promise here is that we should now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. We've heard this instruction from Scripture, throughout Scripture, in many different ways. And of course, why should it be any different here? This is not a passive sort of a situation. In order to benefit from this instruction, though, listen, now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. Folks, this will look different for each of us today. But the idea is that we should be able to call sin what it is, identify youthful lusts that draw us away from God and the truth that is in Christ Jesus and the work that he desires from us or to do with us. We need to identify those things and flee. Flee means, this, this is the picture I have in my mind. If I was in a house and it was on fire and I was told to flee and I was sitting at dinner time, the idea of flee in my mind would be to drop my knife and fork and grab nothing and run out of the house. I think that's a good visual picture. We are being instructed to drop everything and flee, get out of the house. Now, I don't think we actually treat this whole instruction to flee youthful lusts with such urgency. We're like, yeah, I'm just not gonna watch that show, but I'll watch that show. Maybe I'll listen to this, but not this. I don't think we take some of these things as seriously as we ought. That's not a criticism, just the truth. If your house was burning down, you would run out of it fast. And not only that, we are called to pursue righteousness. That's God's activity. Pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace with all of those who call on God from a pure heart. And I would like to finish with that today. But what does it mean then? If it means to, if flee means to run away, what does it mean then to pursue? And we want to pursue righteousness, God's activity. Pursue faith, pursue love, and peace with all those who call on the Lord. I would like to leave an assignment with you, not a written assignment, but a personal challenge with you today. I would like you to consider, if you would, with me, what it might look like or require for, for us to flee from youthful lusts today. For our benefit, for our glory, and for the work that God wants to do through us. I would also like you and we together to consider then, even, even as, if not more importantly, what will it look like for us today to pursue, to chase, to go after righteousness? What will it look like if we make God's activity in our lives and through our lives our main priority today? It will be very interesting, I think, down the road to bear witness and to our testimony about the fruit and the result and the multiplication of life, life in us and through us if we choose to walk this way.